So how do Christians respond to domestic hunger? I want to get right at the answers and along the way try to illustrate as much as I can. And then toward the end, I've just got to kind of share with you from my sidewalk. That's what I know. I know inner city Dallas. I've been there 18 years every day interfacing with beautiful people who are incredibly wealthy in ways other than materially. And if there's any genius in our approach, it's certainly not from the leadership, it's from the folk that we just refuse to turn away from. Not that we might benefit them, but that we might enter into a relationship of reciprocity where the resources are flowing back and forth across the equation in a way that creates good chemistry and changes things. And I'll say more about that as I go forward. Let me begin with, with the truth. If we're going to respond to domestic hunger and poverty, we have to embrace the truth that the way to God is only through the earth. The way to heaven is only through the pain of the world. And I think the incarnation of Christ illustrated to us the incredible extent of God's love in that He sent His Son into the brokenness of the world, into the pain of the world, into the marginalized population of the world, into the oppressed of the world, as had been the case during the Exodus as well and throughout the history of Israel. God demonstrated His love and that He entered the world to redeem it and to heal it and to patch it up and to care for it because of His great, as Dr. Forbes said so well, parental love. But the only way for me to get to God is by walking through the experience of this world toward God. I tell churches all the time, it's time we cash in on our grace. Can we all just agree that, that heaven is sort of a, a fixed reality for us as people of faith? We, we don't have to worry anymore about the afterlife, right? We don't have to worry about the next life. That's taken care of so that we might concern ourselves with this one. And that's the right to call of Christ in the world that's broken. I grew up the son of sharecroppers. My dad and my mom were raised 50 miles north of Abilene, Texas. And after World War II, my, my dad and mom left the farm because it just dried up. And until oil came into the picture after World War II in northwest Texas, there wasn't much there, so everyone kind of left those towns behind. And they made their way to Des Moines, Iowa. And then on to Spokane, Washington. That's where I was born. And then they came back to Texas and went to this sleepy little suburb north, in, north of Dallas called Richardson. 1,200 people at the time. And my dad went to work for the city of Richardson as their city secretary. And after about six years, he went into the development business with some private real estate development people. And so I grew up in the context of that suburban, growing, affluent community. And my dad did very well for a guy who had to go to college. And we went to a little church at the corner of Phillips and Abrams and Richardson, a little church of Christ. And I remember in retrospect when I got into college, at Harding College, where Richard also went to school, I look back on my experience in church and I was flabbergasted by how protected I had been from the reality of the world. Because when I was growing up in that little church, that little nondescript church on Abrams Road, America was on fire and Southeast Asia was on fire. And if you were dependent upon what happened inside that church house to understand those realities, you wouldn't know anything about it. Because no one ever said a word about the world or its pain. Not really. There was a lot of preaching about personal morality about the world, about avoiding the trappings and 
immoral snares of the world, but there was absolutely no word about the pain. As I went over to college and had no intention of being in ministry, I went on a football scholarship primarily because the girl I was going to marry with here, and so I followed her there, and I played a little football, and was going to be a lawyer or a coach. I know that's a wide discrepancy. <laughs> I was a little unsettled at the time, but I knew why I was there, because Brenda was there, and so I was there, and, and I thought of the influence of these professors who opened up the entire scripture to me, and I think unbeknownst to them, they liberated me from legalism in my background and set me free of the grace of Christ. But there was a professor there who lost his job because he insisted on talking about second and third Isaiah. It was a rather conservative outfit. But he taught me the prophets of Israel. And Jim Howard linked the prophets of Israel to the ministry of Jesus Christ and what it was in the schedule. And I began to deal with these questions. And I really got angry. Why did my church not let me know what was really the point? The point is not whether or not you use a piano in worship. That's one of our problems. <laughs> By the way, I'm a Methodist now, so I got to go over there. The problem is not what you call the preacher. The problem is not how you organize the church. The problem is not how often you have communion. The problem is an entire segment of the population is discriminated against because they happen to be African American. Injustice prevails in this country. Oppression prevails. Jim Crow rules. And the people of God should have something to say about that and they must have right. working people who work hard every day but don't earn enough money to keep their families afloat. We provided public interest law counseling through four attorneys who do nothing but argue cases in family law courts and civil law courts in Dallas County. And it's really interesting, when poor folks show up with good counsel, they always win. 85% of our law work is family law. We open and close about 350 cases a year. And pardon my French, we kick butt. Because we got great, I don't think we've lost 10 cases in 18 years. Because we have accomplished attorneys whose, whose faith is leading into the courthouse. And they're, they're living on what I pay them, and that's not much. And so we go on tours, we see the food distribution, we see the legal services, we go down to the medical clinic, better. Healthcare system just gave us a new 6,800 square foot medical clinic. We've been managing an overcrowded clinic since 1990. And our patient load has grown and grown and grown. And we serve those who are uninsured. And so, Bayer said, Hey, look, we've got this clinic. It's not working very well for us. It's deep in South Dallas. We're not culturally competent. I pointed out that you know, they probably weren't culturally competent. That the, the police car that sits in the parking lot all day long, the armed guard inside the waiting room, the little sign on the door that says, no public restrooms or water fountains might make you culturally incompetent. <laughs> so we got rid of the cops, and the wind is clean now, and people are flooding into that center, and I take people on a tour over there. Or, or we go out into North Dallas and South Dallas where we have 133 apartments that house chronically homeless, disabled persons. And housing is like intervention on alcohol. It's a level set. It's starting over 87% of people who are given permanent supportive housing and housing first across this great country stabilize largely on their own. Less than 15% of those housed in that way need more serious psychiatric assistance. The answer to homelessness in America is simple. Home. House.
Over the last two summers, we've served over a million and a half meals to kids who qualify for the free lunch program that are out of school during the summer. We've done that in a partnership with the Texas Department of Agriculture and Pepsi Logistics Company. Pepsi's not a pop company. Pepsi's a logistics company. And our AmeriCorps folks have ridden the Pepsi trucks into apartment complexes where kids don't have programs, and we fed meals on a mobile schedule as well as on a stationary schedule with day camps and such, church groups. And I showed them that. And invariably, and the more evangelical the worse it is, invariably, we'll get back in the office, we'll sit around a conference table, and someone will say, now where's the ministry? Where's the ministry, Larry? You just saw the ministry. No, 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 no. Where do you win people to Christ? Now think about the assumption that such a question carries with it. The assumption is poor folk are poor because they don't believe in Jesus Christ. That the real deal is to tie it all up according to our parameters, not according to what someone might say to you about where they are. Let me tell you something about inner city folk in Dallas. I can count on two hands the number of people who confessed to me and didn't believe in Jesus Christ in the last 18 years. When I left my church in Richardson after 14 years, and things were going well there, and I was undecided about whether to make this new assignment. My wife finally looked at me across the den one night and said, James, if you believe all this stuff you've been telling us, you have no choice. Just take the job and shut up. <laughs> so I did. And people would say really nice, well intentioned things to me when I was leaving church, like, well, it's just so wonderful you're taking Jesus in the inner city. And I was so stupid, I just pawed the ground and they what I realized was I didn't bring Jesus in. I found Jesus in the universe. Because the witness is sure enough flowing back toward me more than my witness toward the inner city. And Jesus, I'm here to tell you, never left the inner city. Church did. A whole bunch of churches. Church, you. I'm not talking about some benevolence committee. 
back up and some guy wanders in off the street and I don't know where he is. I'm talking about the central mission of the Church of Jesus Christ.
They're not even in the parking lot of the stadium. If you don't cross the finish line first, what kind of a goofball are you? Do something with the privilege. Dallas Independent School District has a program called Principal for a Day. So a year ago, I was lucky to go into a South Dallas elementary school with a principal for the day. And this was about a 40-year-old school. And it was spit shine, I mean, it was, it was Marine Corps shiny. Whoever was taking care of that school was unbelievably proud and doing a great job. And I was greeted by four sixth grade students at the door. And for the first two hours of my time in that school, they took me everywhere in that school, just me and those four kids. They introduced me to every teacher, they took me to every room closet, they took me to the gym, they showed me their community garden, they took me all of they knew everything about the school. I went into a classroom where Teach for America, a teacher was teaching, and he had his class, it was a social science class, and he had his class divided up into the continents. And so as he was lecturing and talking, I don't even remember what his subject was, but he said, Africa, what's the answer to this question? And Africa would stand up and answer. And if they couldn't answer, they'd collaborate until they had an answer. And it was that way, the whole that, the art class, the music class, it was all just phenomenal. And the kids, as they went from class to class and broke for lunch, they were just so well ordered and all of their uniforms and everything was wonderful. I told my wife when I got home, I felt like I'd been to elementary school where I went to elementary school. The principal was an African American woman, obviously respected her four senior year at that school. The student body was about typical of the ISD. African American and Hispanic about half and half with a smattering of white kids. When I got home, I looked at the website and I looked at the school. And I saw flat test scores. And I saw an abysmal percentage of kids prepared for college. And I'm thinking, I've just seen everything that we typically point to for success in education, order, cleanliness, enthusiasm, all that, good teachers. And then I see these test scores, and I'm thinking, where's the this thing? And it just so happened. But that night, I was talking to my oldest daughter, and the next day, her and her husband were going to take my two grandkids, two of my four grandkids, out of school. Because on Monday was State Fair Day in Dallas, and Tuesday was in service training there for teachers in Dallas. And so they were going to have a long weekend and they were going to go to New York City. And so they went to New York City, and on Friday night, my grandchildren were on Broadway watching the Lion King. And on Saturday, I get these text messages from my grandkids taking pictures of the Museum of Natural History in New York City, the largest toy store in the world in New York City. And I got a picture of my seven-year-old grandson, Wyatt, playing pickup soccer in Central Park with a bunch of Hispanic kids twice his age. Had a blast. And it hits me. There's no difference in the kids at Burleson Elementary School and White and Gracie. None. Except experience. Experience that comes from love. Experience that comes from the ability to go there. Those sweet children who were somebody else's grandkids in Burleson haven't been to our big shopping center in Norfolk, let alone in Canada. And until we get serious about leveling the playing field economically in this country, we're going to continue to be frustrated. Several years ago, a young man who was running for school board at DISD came to my office and said, Larry, what's the biggest problem facing DISD? And I said, that's simple, Brent. It's not easy, but it's simple. You're not going to want to hear it, but it's simple. He said, well, what is it? I said, the word is poverty. He said, what's poverty got to do with public education? I said, just everything. Just everything. We've got to do something about prisons. Yeah. prisons. Prisons, especially as it relates to drug abuse, is killing the inner cities of America. Prisons are killing the inner city communities of America because they're systematically harvesting the leadership of those communities and setting young men on a path to total destruction with no options. We, it's the new Jim Crow. It's absolutely the new Jim Crow. And we've got to somehow come together. I see it over and over again. A young man will get busted for possession of marijuana.
marijuana. It's so bad, Pat Robertson even came out the other day and said marijuana might be good. That's not bad. Even Pat Robertson's good. It takes a while, but you know. Yeah. I see it over and over again. Young man who busts in possession, he'll go down to the court, they'll get probation for three years, they'll have to pay a probation penalty, they have to make probation needs. Maybe he'll get through that, maybe he won't. He'll be under pressure constantly. He gets busted again, now he's going to go downtown, right? He's going to be in state jail for 24 to 30 months. He's not going to do anything while he's in there worthwhile except get a record and a bunch of tattoos. And then he's going to come back home determined to tell the truth and do better. And you know what? If you are determined to tell the truth with a record, you can't get a job or a place to live. You talk about setting somebody up for failure and frustration. And then he'll go back to the neighborhood where he came from and probably do some of the same things he did before. And maybe he takes some comfort in the arms of a girl he loves. And now there's a little baby coming. He gets busted again. Now he's going down for four or five years. And he leaves behind a baby and a mama that he loves. With no recourse. And they're now all alone. And he's in jail. I watch this over and over and over again. We've got more people in prison in Texas than there are prisoners in Russia. And the racial breakdown is disproportionately against people of color, and it's wrong, it's sinful. Jesus cares more about that than he cares about what form of contraception you are decided to use. And it's time for us to put pressure on politicians of faith to speak for his power. When you suffer, I suffer. 
an injustice then to use, an injustice then to make everybody else. There's got to be a new kind of solidarity. And we've got to have a talk about solidarity. And that brings me to the last thing I want to say. We've got to recommit to the necessity of partnerships, collaborations, and cooperation. And maybe the most important part of this conference is what's going to happen from here to the As you decide how to break up the work, how to connect with one another, how to pray together, how to hug each other, how to hold together no matter what the opposition is, how to raise the steam for the sake of the kingdom of God. It's time for a movement. If it's Jesus Christ, I'm all in. If it's something else, I'm all in. We need a movement to take back the center decency of this nation. A partnership, she says, is when a group of people come in a room, close and lock the door, put stuff on the table, wrestle some deep, difficult problem on the ground as best they can for the next meeting. But when they leave the room, they leave everything on the table. They don't take it off. Because they know they're calling something together that's bigger than any of them. Bigger than any of them. I got a lot more to say, Richard, I'm going to quit.